and welcome. This is Mary Ellen McGonigal here with Erin Swenlin each and every Thursday afternoon with Chart Wise Women, the show where we share our knowledge so that we can empower you and we are hopefully doing it in an engaging manner. So Erin, how are you doing this week? Yes. I'm doing you? great. I have to say now that I'm not melting here, it helps a lot. <laughs> Yes, too true. I know a lot of people are reading about fires taking place out in California and nowhere near where I am in Los Angeles. And Erin, I think you're in a safe zone, if you will. For now. Uh, for now. But uh, otherwise, yeah, we're just uh, chugging along here. Pretty, pretty dicey market this week. I have to say we uh, oftentimes, we like to see the markets trend and uh, act in a manner that is uh, orderly and uh, it can be a little discerning when it doesn't. But today we are going to be focusing on that concept of orderliness, one of the many ways that you can uh, really get your arms around the market. And we're calling it the domino effect. And in essence, it has to do with, uh, well, we'll get more into this, but how certain economic reports and items that are big, broader picture can really impact for uh, certain asset classes. So it's all with an eye toward helping you kind of make sense of the markets. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with our wisdom of the week. And Erin, I'll go ahead and let you start. Yours is the second one down there. Yes, it is. Uh, what I think is important is to understand those unique relationships between some of the different asset classes. Because if you recognize one is doing well, then that tells you that more than likely the other one is not going to do well. So learning about which ones affect uh, each other, I think is important. Yeah, so hence the domino effect. And my wisdom this week is uh, all about that same concept. It's it's called intermarket relationships. And this is something for those of you familiar with John Murphy's work, head technician here at stockcharts.com. He's also a big proponent of that. And it is an important aspect of the market. So we're going to simplify that for you today and just give you more tools for your tool belt as you navigate uh, these kind of tricky markets here. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get started with that first relationship that we are going to be talking about, the uh, COVID 19. We've seen uh, the Delta variant has really made its way, unfortunately, throughout the U.S. and really globally. There are certainly uh, certain areas within the U.S. that are getting more impacted. But from here, I wanted to share with you news that came out earlier, uh, actually yesterday, very big news, where the U.S. Health Department is recommending vaccine boosters beginning September 20th. They are actually going to start those boosters. It's recommended eight months after you may have received that individual or original dose, then the uh, booster is then going to be available. So from here, I'm going to share with you some stocks that are related to this vaccine, this new rollout, and the continued current rollout of first-time vacciners, if you will. Uh, so there has been a very definite impact. So let's go ahead from here and take a look at one of the ways that you can put your arms around the headline news and the impact. So I'm going to take us right into the healthcare sector. One of the ways that we can do that, it's going to be pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and medical supplies. These are going to be the guys that are allowing you to, uh, or providing the devices that allow the vaccine to be administrated. And then also, of course, the, uh, the ability for the pharmaceuticals to roll out those vaccines. So let's go ahead and start with biotechs very quickly here. What we can see is the, uh, I'm going to sort it by stock charts, technical rating, because there are 500 biotech stocks. But up here in the forefront, we should be able to uh, pick out some of these very much 
vaccine and COVID cure related. And we're going to start out here with Regeneron, R-E-G-N. We can see it had this nice base breakout. The company just came out with earnings, but they do have a what's called a cocktail that is very effective against the virus if you are hospitalized. So the stock has entered into a nice uptrend. So this is a significant move upward that you can see. Uh, from here, I'm just going to go ahead and share a couple of other very relevant major bio uh, tech stocks that are involved. This is Moderna. Many of you may have received your vaccine from the company. We can see that it entered into this big uptrend. This is earnings related, but also related to the fact that we are continuing to roll out. Moderna has a very good efficacy rate. This week it is pulling back, but that's very standard given its overbought uh, position here. Your outside momentum indicators remain positive. I would argue here that it is resetting for another potential leg up. Let's take a look at a big pharma company, another big uh company that is involved. This is Pfizer, of course, and uh, I know for myself, Pfizer was one that I was vaccinated, uh, the double dual vaccination. And uh, just take a look, it's in a very confirmed uptrend. And certainly one last name that we can take a look at that is going to be uh, the J&J &J was a little bit later in their rollout, July, I'm sorry, March 21st. So they're talking about eight months subsequent to that, that secondary vaccine. And we can see that it's been in a very nice confirmed uptrend, finding upside support at this 10 day simple moving average. So quite simply, this concept that headline news, certainly something as impactful as vaccines, uh, can be very, very, uh, as far as intermarket relationships, can point you toward stocks and areas that are going to uh, benefit from that continued vaccine rollout. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are certainly strong industry groups within that area. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from here, we're going to go ahead and move on to an additional concept here as far as what moves the market. And Erin, uh, it's, yes. it's on all you. It's on me. Okay. Interest rates dropping. The yields are dropping. I've got some great charts to show you on this. So I'm going to start off with the yield array which gives you a look at all of the different um, interest rates, the yields that we're seeing currently. And as you can see, I've got the 30 year all the way down to the one month. So we have all these beautiful colors on the chart. <laughs> Everybody knows I like colorful charts and here you go. So you can see that we had the really strong rising rate environment. And now we're starting to see, we got this consolidation back in April. And since May, it's just been in this big declining trend. Now we got that breakout from that declining trend. So I was thinking things might be a little bit better for um, interest rates. But at this point, you know, it looks like they could be moving off of this declining trend. However, when we dig down a bit deeper, let's look at the 10 year yield. And there you go. So this is T TNX, dollar TNX. This is the 10 year treasury. And you know, we had this really nice bullish double bottom that the that rates went into. You could see we had a very strong declining trend in the short term, but then we got that breakout, and then we also got the breakout that above that confirmation line. So we should have seen a rise about the height of this pattern, and certainly it failed at that 50 day and the uh, other short term declining trend, I'd say longer term than what we had here. And now, you know, it hit that level. And as soon as it turned down, I had to say, um, I was not expecting uh, to see rates rise for a little while. And certainly we're seeing them deteriorate um, at this point. Mm -hmm. We've got a negative RSI, but you know, with uh, the information we've been getting in the news, with the Fed um, speaking, et cetera, you know, some of this could get a little bit um, more dicey, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can see the declining trend on the 30 year. Um, we've got um, the 50 is crossed below that 200 for a death cross, as we call them. 
And so at this point, I mean, it's a really bearish configuration on these treasury yields, but we'll have to keep an eye out uh, and see if yeah. we're gonna see rising rates. Now, the good news is lower interest rates are good for stocks. Generally, it's good for a growing economy. There are uh, two areas that are impacted very closely, but I'm gonna let you uh, share some more of your beautiful Just one charts. More. Yeah. This is, so if you did want to get into the bond area, so if we see interest rates lowering, that means bonds are going to move higher. And if they start to rise, then you're going to see um, bond prices move lower. So watching that intermarket relationship, if you will, I think is important. We have a lot of really bullish items on this chart as far as the uh, 20 year treasury bond ETF, TLT. And we have kind of a nice base here, as we were talking about, this sort of rounded saucer shape, kind of a handle that's being built here with a continuation pattern, this uh, symmetrical triangle. So the expectation would be a breakout here. But as I said, if we start seeing rising yields, that's certainly going to take the bond prices lower. You bet that inverse relationship. So I'm just going to share very quickly here another look at that 10-year yield and then two groups that are very closely tied in. So we can see interest rates were really on the uptick here going into the beginning of April and have subsequently been falling. So let's look at one industry group that is uh, very tightly, tightly uh, tied to interest rates. They do well in a rising interest rate environment, and that is regional banking. This is KRE, the ETF. Higher interest rates are good for banks because they have higher profit margins on their lending. So we can see with this drip lower this week in interest rates that regional banks are suffering. As I said, lower interest rates are not good for banks. And one last group that we can uh, take a quick look at is technology stocks because uh, tech stocks have been on the move. But uh, generally, if we go back to this period, uh, there was a pullback. Higher interest rates are not good for high growth stocks because it implies that their forward growth is going to be lower due to those higher interest rates. So that's another intermarket relationship that we can pay attention to when we are looking at uh, yields and uh, interest rates. So we are going to take a very brief break. When we get back, we have lots more to share with you. We'll be right back. And we are back. We are going to begin this second half by taking a look at impactful news relating to the Federal Reserve. And Federal Reserve policy is one of the most impactful uh, policies uh, that really formulates the markets and how they perform. Currently, we've been in a period of what's called easing monetary policy, where the Fed is coming in, buying bonds, providing liquidity during this pandemic, and it's been the major boost for the markets. They did, uh, the Fed came out, there was news yesterday that they may be tapering or pulling back from that very easy monetary policy, which in turn uh, really spooked the markets, but it did so very briefly. So we are still in good standing. Uh, the Fed is all about interest rates, their uh, actions, their comments are going to impact those interest rates. So it all ties in uh, very nicely. So from here, we are going to talk about another 
an, an additional headline moving impactful event that tends to happen once a quarter. And that is when the famous investor Warren Buffett shares with the world, or actually he is mandated to file SEC forms with his uh, movements over the second quarter, which stocks he may have added or removed. And oftentimes we will see a big pop in those stocks that he added, and then likewise a uh, decline in names that he's moved. So the uh, uh, actually reduced. So this is his Berkshire Hathaway uh, fund that owns these. It's a portfolio. So first up, we have Kroger KR, and uh, Warren Buffett's report was released earlier this week. And take a look at the pop that Kroger had. He did add it. Uh, he already had it in his portfolio, but he increased his holdings by 21%, one of the biggest increases. And we can see that the stock really popped and had a big move. I'm going to share with you just a couple of other names, and then we'll take a look at some of the stocks from his earlier quarters and see how long lasting that kind of uh, news can be. Uh, this is AON, an insurance company. They pre Buffett's announcement. So it gapped up here and it's in a nice set uptrend, but overall it is continuing to trend higher. He added the stock initially back here in the first quarter and uh, he increased his position for this particular stock. On the downside, we didn't see a lot of downside movement, but he decreased his holdings in a number of big pharma stocks, but it appears that the vaccine news is overriding uh, Buffett's de uh, deduction in some of these stocks. So let's take a quick look at a stock. This is another one that Buffett reduced his portfolio holdings in, General Motors. But let's take a look at a name that Warren Buffett surprisingly added in the first quarter, and it really gave a big boost. The news that Buffett got into restoration hardware, uh, there was a big boost. No additional shares added. The stock is drifting lower, certainly in line with other. This is a retail furniture store, so uh, not a lot of movement there. But again, that concept that Warren Buffett's holdings can have a push on these stocks is a uh, something else to keep in mind as you're navigating these markets. Absolutely. It's not that he's always right, but mm -hmm. he's right a lot of the time. Yes. So, so people sit up when they hear what, the, what, exactly. he's, what he is doing. Okay. So I believe, Aaron, it's back to you for some other symmetry and inner market relationships here. Absolutely. So one of the things that I cover every day in my decision point alert is the dollar and gold and gold miners as well. I'm gonna sneak those in. But one of the relationships that I think a lot of people are familiar with would be the fact that the dollar is, I mean, the gold is denominated in dollars. So when the dollar rises, that makes gold fall. So they have a pretty solid inverse relationship. Now they, they will travel differently at times, um, but a lot of times that they will not. So let's start with the dollar right here. So this is a one year chart of UUP. So I follow the dollar based on the ETF here, UUP, and uh, it works very well. It mirrors the dollar pretty closely. So there's a lot of good things going on in this chart that tell me that the dollar is going to rise. We have the momentum crossover signal here for the PMO. We have a positive RSI. We also have right here, you can see the 50-day EMA is a, has crossed above the 200-day EMA for a golden cross. So we looked at one with a death cross. This is a golden cross. So that suggests that, that the dollar is now in a really bullish configuration. And of course, just looking at the chart, you can see that I have a cup with a handle that we got a breakout from. I was uh, concerned that it wasn't going to execute because we did see the dollar fall, but it's now rising very strongly. And it's now at this level here of resistance, which you could also consider the confirmation line of a really large double bottom. So a lot of things on this dollar chart tells me that the dollar is gonna rise. So what is that gonna do to gold? 
well, gold will fall, right? So we just looked at the dollar. It is currently up 0.44%. And GLD, the ETF that follows gold, is down 0.34. So we have an almost perfect inverse relationship there. And I can even add a correlation here just so you can see what I'm talking about between the dollar and gold. So I'm just going to put this in here, UP, we're going to look at. And if we put this on here, you'll really, you will start to see how that relationship typically is inverse. Look at this, for months, it did exactly opposite the dollar. Now, every now and then they will travel, you know, in the same direction, but typically you're going to see this kind of a correlation. So gold is really struggling. It could be forming a little bit of a flag here, but just seeing that it's tr having trouble getting back into its rising trend, it's having trouble getting back into that prior price range. And now we know the pressure is going to be on because the dollar is likely going to start rising. So and even I think though I have this PMO crossover buy signal uh, readied, I don't think we're going to get it. I think we're going to end up up seeing the momentum turning down just because of that. And maybe we can take a quick look at oil. Oh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say oil prices, another commodity that's sure. tied in with the dollar. So as the dollar rises, uh, the dollar sign Brent, B-R-E-N-T. Oh, another, this is perfectly fine as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So it, top, everything looking pretty, pretty bearish right now for mm -hmm. um, this is USO, the United States oil fund. But you sure. can see it is possibly going to find some support on the 200, but momentum is looking bad. But one other thing that gold actually affects, so the dollar affects gold, gold will also tend to affect gold miners. And the decline in the uh, price of gold has really put headwinds out there for the gold miners. And you can see at this point, they are hitting their annual low for um, this, yeah, for this year. So it needs to hold, they need to hold this. I had this really bullish looking falling wedge, but now it's falling out of that bullish pattern, which tells me um, that's especially bearish for gold miners right now. And you can see under the surface, there's just no participation. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, so we really are getting quite a, a good feel for some of these, uh, the dollar interest rates. And headline news earnings, of course, is another, from my work, one of the biggest drivers of a stock's price. Uh, so I think we have a minute here. We can just uh, pull up NVIDIA, for instance, today. They came out with their earnings after the news, I mean, after the close yesterday. And the stock is doing well. Really, if you go to Stock Charts, their first, uh, that initial interface page, take a look at the S&P 500 the movers for today. And if you put a candle glance on that, every single one of those names, except for Netflix, uh, Bed, Bed Bath Beyond, Synopsis, all earnings related. NVIDIA, they're all popping uh, as it relates to, for the most part, most of them are earnings driven. So didn't want to leave this segment without pointing that big, powerful uh, inner market relationship as well. Absolutely. So yeah, that's it. I think we are going to uh, just pivot right into our final segment here. And it is called Yeah, That Happened. <laughs> and our, our producer, Eric, uncovered this one. And really, if you guys can get to that headline, you can take a look. The uh, Actually, it was took place in Montana. And there is a uh, Facebook video of a hiker who slept in an underpass in a Montana tunnel. I guess he was, must have been darn tired. And they show a bear just wandering in and kind of poking around, do to do, and walked out. So that hiker, I will argue, is uh, <laughs> he had luck on his side that day. <laughs> he could buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you imagine seeing that post uh, post nap? That would wake you up. Uh, and we were joking that uh, with if we were to encounter a bear market, wouldn't it be great to uh, sleep through that? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just be completely As, out of the market. Let that go. Hibernate. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, move move on. But let's go ahead. I'm going to share a couple of stocks here that are related. These are outdoor related stocks as far as camping and so forth. Uh, first up is Dick's Sporting Goods. Among other sports, they do uh, have a lot in the way of offering outdoor activity. This has been a big winner for my MEM Edge report. We got into the stock back here prior to their super strong earnings. They're due to report next week. Uh, so we're going to be keeping an eye on this one. And then another stock that we can uh, take a look at is Camping World. And uh, gosh, I want to see, uh, see, I'm sorry. I, I know, I don't had remember it, all of I, I No, I had it written down. And of course, you know how that goes when you need it, but we're sharing with you how you can look up a stock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. So here's CWH Camping World. There's been a lot in the way of outdoor activity, certainly with the resurgence of this Delta variant. People are going on road trips, a lot more camping. However, the stock here is drifting downward. All of your momentum indicators are negative. Uh, we can see when the stock was attempting to reach this prior high, the confirmation just wasn't there. So this particular stock is uh, falling out of bed. And then I did have a uh, another stock and that's Yeti. And I don't know if you're familiar with their products. It is very much geared toward outdoor adventures, whether it is uh, camping chairs, uh, the coolers, they pretty much have everything. It's a real, uh, very, they have a lot of people that follow the brand. They have a good uh, brand management, brand following, but it too is drifting downward here because uh, this is a retailer. There is anticipation, uh, Consumer confidence dropped greatly because of this big pickup in uh, COVID cases. So we can see that the outside momentum indicators, again, in line with uh, some of the other um, retailers, because again, these stocks uh, are impactful if consumers are fearful that the variant spread will impact their pocketbook as far as uh, being able to work and so forth. It's, it is impacting these areas. I, I have one last name and Aaron, you can of course share one if you do, but this is more mm -hmm. of a joke. Uh, the Marriott, because uh, they own the Ritz Carlton. So I would say the heck with camping. Let's go to the Ritz. <laughs> I know that'd be more my style, but. <laughs> oh my gosh. Unfortunately, this is signaling in line, certainly with cruise ships and other travel related. Again, all about the Delta variant. This is that connection that we talked about where you can see certain impactful news. Some areas are being impacted positively, medical stocks. And then of course, where people are gonna pull back on their traveling, that is going to impact negatively uh, some of these travel stocks. And one other name, uh, Aaron, we've talked about traveling to Vegas yeah. simply because it's- I was just gonna say gambling stocks. We gotta look at those. Oh, they're in the dumpster, Aaron. Take a look. This is Las Vegas Sands. And you can see really just, uh, this is a great example of when a stock breaks below this 50 day on big volume. All uh, I, the exit signs flash red for me and we can see how it's trying to rally but being met with upside resistance at these downward trending moving averages. So not yes. not a bet I would take in Vegas. Huh? No, and I have to say I was there recently and you know, a couple of the casinos that I like to see uh, in downtown, they, they were actually just completely closed. Oh my goodness. I well, mean, they have yeah. to be smart. So, okay, well, we are going to leave it at that, Aaron. It's just been uh, a great show. I always enjoy when we can share our wisdom in today's case, uh, talking about those intermarket relationships. And until next week, take care. Yep, absolutely. Keep an eye on those intermarket relationships going into this week and next. I think it's really going to be important. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.